The following is an absolutely fascinating conversation with my good friend, Timothy Hogan. An author and lecturer within the Western Mystery Schools, he is a past master within several different spiritual traditions, including many bodies in Freemasonry and of Rosicrucian lineages. He's a Grand Master for multiple Knight Templar lineages, and runs the Templar Collegia. Timothy Hogan has lectured all over the world, including as a guest speaker at universities and US embassies, and has appeared on numerous television programs worldwide. He's the author of The Alchemical Keys to Masonic Ritual, The 32 Secret Paths of Solomon, Revelation of the Holy Grail, Entering the Chain of Union, The Way of the Templar, Novo Clavis Esoterica, Thoughts from Meditations, and The Elements of the Elements. He's also known for taking diplomatic meetings with both governmental and spiritual world leaders. I met Timothy in Egypt. We travelled together for two weeks, visiting the ancient temple sites and structures, pyramids, and I was fascinated by his encyclopedic knowledge of the mystery schools. Please remember to support Project Unity by liking this video, subscribing, hitting the notification bell to stay updated, and please do comment below and share your thoughts on this conversation. I want to know what you think about all of these topics. And if you want to support Project Unity even further, you can become a Patreon. This will give you access to our private Discord server, as well as early access to all of my interviews and other content. And now, without any more delay, here is my conversation with Timothy Hogan. It was uh, it was a real pleasure to get to know you in such a unique setting. We were traveling through Egypt, exploring temples and pyramids and listening to people like yourself and Johnny Enoch and Muhammad Ibrahim as you explained and interpreted the mystery schools of Egypt. It was a great first experience for me. I feel like there was actually a really good dynamic in our group when we were out there. I agree 100%. I, and I have so many uh, just wonderful memories with you traveling around uh, in horse carriages and <laughs> on boats and planes and uh, through the desert and, and uh, you know, visiting crazy perfume shops and the whole thing. So it, was, it was great. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, there was a there was a laughing there was a laughing joke, a little inside joke on on the trip because there was this great guy, this this really eccentric character who was selling us perfume in this shop, and he he just had this fantastic laugh every time he finished a sentence. He'd sit there and go like ah ah ah, and that, <laughs> that became a bit of a running joke on the trip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've laughed about it quite a bit since. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, our, our trip, all the temples we saw and, uh, you know, all the experiences we had, I mean, really just incredible. So, I mean, I know you've been so before, happy. but was there anything that kind of stood out to you? Any any place we went to that was of a certain significance to you personally? Um, yeah, I, you know, I really, well, I, I was really taken with um, Abydos mm. and also Dendera. Uh just the, the, the things that we saw in those areas and uh, particularly some of the, the areas that were closed off to the public that we got to go in was really, you know, it was really captivating, really amazing. Yeah, that was that was one of my favorite places, the, uh, the Dendera Temple to uh, Hathor. I did the, did a video on that that was on my YouTube channel because I just thought it was such an incredible place. I mean, the beauty of the uh, the hieroglyphs and the painting, but then obviously some of the symbology that was present in that place going into the subterranean. I mean, that felt like the most Indiana Jonesy style thing that I've done in Egypt, going into these subterranean kind of tunnels full of hieroglyphs. And then we got access to that top level. And I've just got it on video. Johnny's so excited. Like, we've never been here before. This is such a big deal. Dude. This is profound. Oh. All the netters, look at this. All the netters lined down the walls. And this is the ultimate secret at the top of the crypts. And it's up, up, up above on purpose. So look at this. Above Hathor, which is resonance and oh, vibration, wow. there's the gate. Oh, wow. Opening it up. Tim, so, pro so profound, brother. Dean. Look so at this. Look, Look at this, this. Brother. This is the consciousness rises from the lotus. Here's the gift of the nethers with the energy. And look at this. Oh, wow. All the nethers leading up. And look what's at the top. This is the top crypt. This is this had, we haven't been able to get access to this before. There's Hathor uh, with vibration resonance. And look what's up there. The oh, gate. Yeah, the gates. 
here's the keys to the Stargates, the mysteries. Being up here, yeah. we, we saw like, you know, Hathor and the Stargate above the head. And I mean, my God, for me, as a, like a, a layman, just kind of jumping into the esoteric, it was hard to keep up with everything. But you guys just were so good at fluently explaining and interpreting certain things. It was fascinating to just kind of be there and, uh, and listen to you all. Well, it was a lot. I mean, we 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 saw uh, what we saw in 10 days. Uh, most, most people don't see in you know, going to Egypt 20 times. Right. So it was really, really an amazing trip. In that yeah. Regard. I think some of my favorite moments were when we were just kind of sat around the tables in the evening on like the Nile cruise and in the hotels and just talking about all of these subjects with each other and, you know, listening to you talk about some of your adventures because you've had a, you've had a pretty interesting life my man and quite a unique upbringing. And I think people would love to hear this if you could maybe take us back to the start because you were, you were introduced to the world of secret societies very early on in your life, and this is no doubt impacted you in a lot of ways. So could you just, just tell us how you discovered the uh, secret society ties within your family and talk about your early introduction into this type of lifestyle? Yeah, so my, well, my first exposure to anything was um, actually when I was eight years old. I was uh, sent to a summer camp. Uh, it's called Geneva Glen Summer Camp, and it was uh, a camp that was started in 1922. It's about to celebrate its 100th year anniversary this year, but it was uh, it was set up uh, by a number of people, but who uh, but one of the main directors was a was a guy. Um, uh, well, there was a a guy and his wife, the Gilmores, and, and uh, uh, they were heavily involved in Freemasonry, and uh, a number of the people that were helping them set up the camp were involved in Freemasonry and were, you know, had also had some Rosicrucian connections and Templar connections, and so they, they set up a program within this um, summer camp where you know they bring in about a thousand campers every summer and they put them through a knighthood program where they have to go through uh each year they, they're striving for a new degree or a new rank and they start out you know i started out as a page when i was eight years old and i you know i had to learn what that was and what the qualities of a page were I had to learn humility and meekness and uh, and, and, and do acts of humble service and things of this nature. And, and after the, the session was over, the, there was a, a ceremony uh, in which you basically find out whether you made your rank or not. And if you did, then you were knighted uh, for, that, for that degree, that rank. And, uh, and then... You, you, then you'd come back the next year and you'd start to go for the next degree, which was and squire. Obviously, you probably didn't understand the true relevance of it. It was just a fun summer camp, yeah. right? No, yeah, it was just a fun thing. I mean, it was the seriousness was it was very impactful in seriousness. And, and the ceremony was, um, you know, it was very impactful on me. I mean, I remember... I remember the first time I, I remember the first time kneeling to uh, be knighted. I, I had a, uh, you know, it was a little, a little scary because I didn't know <laughs> he was this adult with a sword, you know, <laughs> coming at me. And I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, uh, it was very, you know, it was very impactful. Uh, but, you know, it, it was the type of thing where, there were six degrees or six uh, ranks uh, culminating in a Sir Knight degree. And uh, it, so it took a minimum of six years to complete that program. But, um, but it wasn't guaranteed that you would make your rank every year. So you'd have to, if you didn't make it, you'd be challenged to come back the next year and, and strive for it again. And and each rank had different qualities, and and it, of course it all revolved around the Arthurian myths and the 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 legends of the Holy Grail, 
and the stories of Merlin and and uh, did you have like friends outside of this where you were kind of going out to them and saying about all this stuff and they were like what we're not getting taught any of these things <laughs> where are you hearing about Merlin yeah I mean <laughs> yeah knighthood? for sure I mean it was it was kind of a strange thing because it was it was almost like um you know you were privy to this this strange ceremonial uh experience that was very personal and, and meant a great deal to you and you established these bonds with these people that uh, you only saw them during the summer and most of the time you didn't see them throughout the year i mean there were some people you'd see maybe who might go to your school that you would see and you know, it was kind of like this inside knowledge, right? Like, oh, yeah, right. We have this yeah. connection, but but um, so that was kind of my foundation of, of things, and and I did that for, you know, I became a Sir Knight in that program, and uh, and by the time I was eighteen, uh, then I, I became a staff member there, and and there were some other awards I received, but. But ultimately, I started looking into where did all this come from? Why why did they implement all this? Like, who's running this? Like, what was the intention behind this? And uh, I, that, that's when I started finding some of the backstory and the back history of these secret societies and fraternity, fraternal orders that had been involved in creating it. And uh, And then... From there, I just started looking into those, and and, uh, and on and on it and, went, and on and on it went. Yeah, and so it started out when I was um, eighteen. I wanted to become a Freemason, but I found out that back then you couldn't become a Freemason until you were twenty-one. So I wasn't old enough to be a Freemason yet. Uh, I did find out that uh, both of my grandfathers and and my father had had some involvement in freemasonry and so i talked with them i was totally surprised they hadn't said anything about it my entire childhood i had, I had no idea uh, so they they gave me some books to read and they kind of you know told me to focus on college and uh and that you know, after I turned twenty-one, then I could I could look into uh, uh, you know being initiated into the Masonic system. And then, meanwhile, I also got involved in the uh, ancient mystical order Rosicrucis, the Rosicrucian order. Uh, they allowed me to join at eighteen, and so I started studying there, and. So that was kind of like my beginning of, of exposure to things. And uh, eventually, you know, as I pursued those further, I became a, a master within uh, different lodges. And I had become a, uh, I, you know, I, I moved forward from being an officer to a, a, ultimately a master of the lodges. And then I became a Grand Lodge representative uh, for both uh, the Rosicrucian tradition and the Masonic tradition. And then from there, eventually I was, uh, found my way into this inner order of, uh, of Templar work and, um, same thing there. I, I just became very involved and, and active in, uh, my local preceptory and, um, uh, eventually over time I, I then became a grand preceptor and then a grand commander and then ultimately a grand master of the template tradition so what do you what do you appreciate the most about being so deeply involved in these kind of societies what do you personally get out of it and do you feel like there are any drawbacks yeah I'm personally I'm I'm you know, it's, it's, these are organizations that are made up of people. And uh, so they bring all their good qualities into them. They may also bring their bad qualities into them. But uh, the systems themselves are designed to encourage people to, um, to 
accentuate their uh, their positive qualities and try to bring those out more. And uh, it just, you know, in general, I found that the, the quality of people tends to be a little bit, um, you know, they're people that want a little bit deeper things in life. They're, they're looking to make true impacts on their communities. They're trying to make the world a better place. They're trying to make themselves better people and, and to hold themselves to higher standards. And that's something I really value. In, uh, are they perfect? No. You know, I mean, anyone who's, who's human is not perfect. I mean, we live in an imperfect world with imperfect systems, but, but we strive for it. So um, in general, uh, it's been a very, very positive experience in that regard. And I think most importantly, uh, these societies try to preserve certain mysteries and they try to uh, support education related to mysteries of, of that you know the normal masses generally tend to not really care about or or get spooked by or um, don't aren't comfortable examining you know so you find a group of people who actually are interested in looking into things that may be uh, off the beaten path so to speak <laughs> so i've appreciated that about it yeah well that actually that, that leads into something i wanted to ask you because obviously there is a veil of mystery attached to secret societies like the Freemasons and Rosicrucians, Knights Templar and all these other groups. And um, for the outsider perspective, they're usually associated. And to be fair, this is usually from the masses who, as you said, are not usually uh, as interested in these types of topics, but the usual association of these types of societies is with dark rituals or controlling the world through shadowy groups, the whole idea of the Illuminati and global conspiracy. So as someone who spent essentially their entire life within these types of societies, what would you say to those who label Freemasonry and other uh, mystery schools as dark or satanic or at the very least unnecessary because many people kind of say that these societies are restricting the flow of necessary knowledge keeping it to themselves when it should be freely shared amongst everyone so and this isn't an un uncommon perspective so i'd be interested in hearing your response to that type of viewpoint um that people have on secret societies yeah i mean there, there's certainly been uh you know the fear of course people fear anything they don't know and they're right. not a part of and so it always it's easy to project your fears onto something that uh, you don't know the truth of, so to speak. But I will say in general uh, that these organizations, while they do try to preserve knowledge and try to perpetuate knowledge, and they do try to get this knowledge out to the public in subtle ways, sometimes not ways you would expect. Sometimes it's through entertainment um, you know, through Hollywood or through music industry or through um, popular fiction. Uh, but th they're trying to get these ideas out to the public. And the, the challenge isn't usually so much that the societies themselves don't want to get the information out. The, the challenge is that the public has been quick to uh, persecute and uh, anything that's different mm. or fringe or ideas that aren't uh, mainstream or, or ideas that may go against the economic agenda that's being perpetuated by governments or religious establishments at the time. And so the only way these things can be preserved is within these hidden secret societies because the governments themselves are, are the first to try to suppress them. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a real problem. I mean, you look at, you've done a lot of um, uh, interviews related to UFO phenomenon, for example. Well, you know, Freemasonry has had within its rituals since the 1700s, 
things pointing to UFO activity, encouraging the study of UFO activity, and even suggesting that there was other inhabited worlds out there in the universe. Well, is and, that is that uh, within some of the actual texts, like the Freemasons? Yeah, within the act within the actual rituals of Freemasonry. Wow, I mean, it's been there since the 1700s. But I didn't know I that. Mean, if you were, yeah, if you were to try to, uh, if you were to try to, you know, 200 years ago, even a even 50 years ago, if you were to try to publicly talk about <laughs> these types of things, you'd be labeled a nut or. Yeah. Or that you'd be silenced, you'd be, uh, you know, that there were there's powers that have tried to control that information and, mm. and, and keep people from being aware of it. So the only way to 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 slowly make people aware of it is to, you know, through through different uh, clandestine or or uh, underground means to, to get that information out. And so secret societies are really good at doing that because they, you know, uh, suppressed and burnt at the stake time and time again over the centuries. So they've just kind of learned like, well, hey, um, we can perpetuate this information, but and we can try to wake people up. Uh, but it's a, it's a hard process. It's kind of like... Uh, it's 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 akin somewhat to the movie The Matrix, in which uh, you know you have these characters that are popping into the Matrix, and they're trying to wake people up, but there's these agents that are trying to shut them down, and so they have to do it in these subtle ways, and, and then meanwhile they have to operate underground, and that's really, it's really a good analogy for or what these secret orders have been doing over the centuries. So. Yeah, no, I, and I, I'd, I'd also argue that a lot of this information in terms of what's passed that down through secret societies, I mean, obviously, you get into the higher levels, maybe there are some things that are really hard to find outside of these kind of narrow corridors. But I would imagine that the vast majority of this information it is already out there in books, it's already out there online in different ways. <laughs> The kind of mystery school teachings that have been you know part of our uh, infrastructure theologically for hundreds and thousands of years there's evidence of it all over the place and the internet has given us the ability to research and find out a lot of this stuff so it's it's more like i would see it to some degree a bit like going to university or to a college it's the information is already out there. I could look at stuff about physics or biology or chemistry online, but if I want to really learn about it, if I want to truly understand the mechanics of these things and I go and do a degree and I do a PhD or I do a master's and a doctorate. And so I could, I would see that the mystery schools in a similar way, a lot of this information is out there. A lot of this information is available to you intuitively. And it's been plenty of intuitives who have given us that information over time. But if you want to refine that and if you want to become more of a, a you know a master of that information then you're going to go to a school you're going to go to a university you're going to study yeah that's very true and i think the other thing too that happens i mean people get weird anytime you talk about ritual mm -hmm. right i mean people you know people have all kinds of weird ideas about ritual they start thinking about you know babies being sacrificed and people riding goats and all kinds of weird <laughs> you know silliness but but in reality um uh traditions like you know some of the great mystery traditions that that many great world leaders throughout history have have been attracted to uh the rituals they perform are designed to be experiential so that uh the hope is as you go through this experience or through this ritual that you're going to have a an experience a personal experience with a with a higher level consciousness that transcends uh you know normal just book reading or memorizing of facts or or that type of thing i mean like for example most of the most mystery school traditions have some sort of a ceremony at some point in which and this isn't really giving anything away you can look this up you know but it's one thing to read about it it's another thing to experience it uh 
you know, but they, they go through some sort of a, uh, a ceremony in which the person goes through some sort of symbolic death. And, and then they're, they're raised to like a new life out of it. And uh, depending on how the ritual's done and uh, what the setting is, what the, you know, what the circuitry is, if you will, to, to perform this ritual, um, it's not uncommon for uh, people to have a even an out-of-body experience having gone through this. And, and once you've had an experience like that, uh, that something like that transcends all your mm. book knowledge, all your memorization of facts, yeah. everything you think yeah. you know about yourself and the world. It, 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 it all of a sudden. If you know that there's a part of yourself that survives and, and exists beyond the physical body, then that's a very liberating experience to have, right? Now you're no longer, you don't have the same fear of death that most people have because you know you survive beyond the physical form. And to go through that, uh, you know, if you can then go through life from that point forward, not having the same fears that most people do. I mean, think about how, you know, how many fears keep you from experiencing things and doing things in the world and making real change in the world. And so it's no, it's no uh, wonder that so many leaders come out of these mystery school traditions because they no longer have the same fears that most people have. You know, they're not afraid to step forward and do what's right and to stand up for things. And they know that, like, well, if I get killed doing it, you know, I can just I come back I with, <laughs> and, and I know I'll be OK. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm still going to live on. You know, I know it because I've experienced it. And that's a profound thing. And you're only going to get uh, you're only going to get that through through having that experience and yeah. that's that's done through ritual and um and through the intention of the of the people doing that for the candidate whoever the person is who's being initiated so yeah yeah no ex experience is is the greatest teacher i mean that's i mean we, we have a lot of different examples of that one of the things that i'm very interested in is the emergence of psychedelic research coming back into the play and the fact that you have people who have been chronic depressives and uh, you know reactive anxiety have had therapy for years and years and it's not working but then they have one strong psychedelic experience which is akin to a mystical experience it shares a lot of similarities with transcendental ritual uh, you know visions and and the kind of things that you see in the same scenarios and here we are having this transformative experience and from that emerges a complete change in the way that someone behaves and lives their life and so i think that you know you have these uh, profound moments where if you experience something for yourself are you still there because it looks like you've frozen on my screen by the way timothy I'm not quite sure what happened then i just suddenly lost you luckily we didn't lose the first section of the interview so that's good <laughs> yeah you, you like you froze up and then you were just i could see you frozen <laughs> <laughs> i could see you for i suddenly i was i was on some like I was rambling about something. I just looked around and saw you were like this. I was like, oh dear, I think, <laughs> yeah. I, think I might have lost Timothy. But um, oh, wow. oh, what, what were we saying? Well, I, okay, so I think we were talking about the fact that uh, experience, oh, experience. Yeah, experience yeah. is the greatest teacher, uh, that psychedelics are another example of how people can have yes. a very transcendental, mystical experience and change their behavior from it. And for me personally, I mean, I had my own experiences with the phenomenon in this very back garden over there. I was outside. I got into a meditative state, a calm, mm -hmm. coherent state of mind. I projected my intentions that I wanted something to respond to me, that I wanted to see something. And it happened. It you know, it happened over a series of months until eventually I had orange orbs float down over the roof of my house. And so I, mm -hmm. you know, for, for me, these were transformative events. This led to me even having this YouTube channel and doing what I'm doing now. And so you're absolutely right that experience is the greatest teacher and it, it can be very difficult when you've had these types of transformative experiences that not everyone goes through and when you haven't had it you don't understand and so it can be very difficult to talk about a lot of these types of things with people who haven't gone through that type of path yeah 
That's right. That's exactly right. So when you have a when you're when you are in a mystery school or in a, a, a you know a mystical fraternity or a you know secret society that uh, that's a safe place for that. Exactly. Right? You can you can learn off of other people's experience uh, and you know without sounding crazy um, or being uh, you know belittled for for looking into to different things uh, and uh, you you can sometimes within a group if you have a group uh, projecting their intentions on something then uh, yeah. you also can get a bigger outcome as well and, well it's co it's controversial if it's a secret society but people need to remember that in churches and in you know these types of in these religious buildings that we've created that's exactly what we're doing it's ritual it's initiation it's ceremony Right. That's right. And and uh, and even our corporations, you know, mm. our corporates have corporate secrets, you know, I mean, <laughs> right. You don't know. You don't know what the next, uh, you know, Apple product is that's going to be that was designed three years ago that's going to be released next month or whatever. <laughs> you know, necessarily, you know, they keep that a trade secret until it's right. ready to release. It. And it's it's, um, you know, so it's not a it's not an uncommon thing. It's just uh, people, I think sometimes when something's secret, uh, people project their fears onto it, you know? Yeah. And yes, there is the potential of abuse. I mean, anytime you have people getting together, doing something secretive, there's always the potential of abuse. But the hope is, at least the societies I've belonged to, uh, they've always encouraged us to strive towards higher qualities yeah and, and create a better world well speaking and there's of something too i will say one one thing too that i think one of the most valuable things that i've found within it that i haven't found anywhere else in the world to be honest is uh is for example a system like freemasonry you have people of all different religious faiths coming together as brothers celebrating the mysteries um they, they can all gather together around an altar and pray together to god whatever they call god whatever that whatever whether they call it allah or, or you know krishna or or what, whatever the great spirit uh you know uh uh, Yahweh, whatever whatever name they call it, doesn't matter. Uh, but they're they're able to celebrate that mystery together. Mm, and yeah, very few things in the world. I mean, that's what builds society is when you have people of different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, who are all able to get come together and celebrate something as as brothers and sisters. Uh, striving for something greater that's what builds order and um, that's, that's the glue that holds together society and you find that within these um, you know these fraternities in, in a way that you just don't find it in in the real world so to speak in the in the profane world and and most of the time most of the profane world people are too busy fighting with each other and jockeying for power and and trying to, and are in these huge egocentric uh expressions where they're like well my way is the best and if you don't follow my way then you're you know you are you know less than dirt and you deserve to be you know uh, suppressed or, or persecuted because you're not following my way that's the way most people are in the world so to be able to find a, you know, for example, we, when we went to Egypt, mm. I knew if I got separated from the group, all I had to do was find a Masonic lodge somewhere or a Rosicrucian lodge, or and I would be welcomed in by people who would consider me their brother, and would would absolutely take care of me, would uh, put their lives on the line for me. To, to make sure that I was all right. And I would do the same thing for them if yeah. they were, you know, in, in the United States. So 
I think I think the, the mystery brings a lot of people together, but it's that bond, it's that brotherhood or sisterhood, and that uh, that feeling that you know that you are uh, welcomed amongst a global community. Yeah, for sure. For what sure. do you what, you mentioned? Um, powerful people and interests who do actually have this kind of knowledge as well. And I, you know, obviously, you've had the experience of this being a profound learning opportunity, but we both acknowledge that there is obviously uh, ch challenges and potentials for there to be abuses of power in these types of groups. What do you think of places, a bit of a curveball question, but I'm kind of curious because no one really talks about it anymore, but I'd like to know what you think. What do you make of places like Bohemian Grove where it was discovered that world leaders from various sectors would kind of converge for a weekend of parties and weird rituals in front of a giant statue of an owl god with one of their uh, one of their ceremonies actually being recorded many years ago by that activist Alex Jones when he managed to sneak onto the property. So just given what yeah. you know about occult societies and influence within the powerful circles of our kind of social hierarchy, what is your take on on Bohemian Grove? Well, you know, Bohemian Grove is actually just kind of a conservative think tank. I, I mean, I can actually hear, I'll show you something. Let me grab it. Yeah, go for it. So here's a, here's a, here's a water <laughs> bottle from Bohemian <laughs> Grove. This is one of the water bottles that they give out to people at Bohemian Grove, you know. I mean, That's it's, brilliant. It's a, Have you been? Have you been? Just, yeah, it's just a, it's just a <laughs> Bohemian Grove water bottle. That's you know? amazing. <laughs> like bottle That's water, amazing. So. But okay, so, uh, but, so it's a conservative think tank, but why the rituals? Why the ceremonies? You know, and, and ceremony is is ceremony is to and ritual is to people what instinct is to animals. Hmm, ritual like helps to provide a a uh, it's like a compass that directs your consciousness a particular way. So, you know, one of the things that that one of the the, the stated reasons for the rituals at Bohemian Grove is uh, they, they're performing a sacrifice, but their sacrifice is they're sacrificing their, um, their worries and their doubts and their, you know, everything that, that keeps them from um, having a, being able to relax and enjoy each other's company. So, you know, it's a symbolic sacrifice of the vices and the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the worries that, 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 that weighed us down. Now, it could be argued, well, is this really necessary? No, it's not necessary. It's a, it's like all rituals. They're, they're, um, you know, they're, it's just a means to bring people together and to have an experience, a shared experience mm. together. I guess what's yeah. weird about it is they do it behind closed doors. So people suddenly find out that all of these, you know, businessmen and, and politicians are going and praying to this big owl god in the, in the middle of the yeah. forest somewhere. I mean, it's funny because I, I get the significance. I see it and it's, it's the mystery schools, it's the tradition, but this is stuff that's not really promoted and then they're out there with yeah, you know, sure. a completely different type of personality on the stage and then they go back and they do this and it's like okay so why aren't you doing that out in the open why don't you want people to know that this is what you're doing is it because you recognize the power of manifestation you don't necessarily want others to be accessing this kind of knowledge i mean do you think that they're trying to keep it those types of people trying to keep it maybe hidden away could be. I mean, uh, it's also just weird, right? <laughs> it is weird. You're doing something weird. You, I mean, you, you know that the world's going to see it as weird. You know? I mean, That's so true. So it's, it's, it's worth it's worth kind of keeping it, you know, on the down low. You know? But, uh, you know, I mean, people aren't going to understand it necessarily. I mean, it's, it's no different <laughs> than um, uh, at universities, you know, there's fraternities too, and, and secret societies, and yeah, they have their yeah. own hazing rituals or, or ceremonies that they keep private, and they may have their own uh, secret forms of recognition. The problem is, in in you know, justifiably, is that when people feel like uh, when you have powerful people getting together behind closed doors and um, potentially making plans for the, for the future of the rest of humanity without 
the rest of humanity really having a say on it, uh, you know, that, that that is a problem, right? Uh, I mean, that, that can be a problem, I mean, for sure. And, and the history of the world is history of conspiracies. I mean, I, I'll be the first to say it. I mean, that, that um, you know, oftentimes it's business conspiracies, but right, it's still right. conspiracies, you know, designed for uh, influential and wealthy people to uh, push their agendas, usually so that they can make money and gain power. And uh, so really, uh, you have to consider what are the intentions behind uh, the group or the, or the people. And I'm not saying that all secret societies are good or have the best intentions. In fact, I'll be the first to say that there's a lot of uh, societies out there that don't have good intentions, in my opinion, and who don't do good things. But have you ever been invited into any of these kind of societies that you've declined because you don't like the way they they go? Yeah, I mean, I've left societies that I yeah. felt were a little suspect, and I've been I have been invited into some societies that I felt didn't have the right intentions or the right focus, and so I declined it. Um, then there's other societies that people assume, I mean, Freemasonry is a good example. I mean, everyone assumes that Freemasons are uh, working, you know, behind the scenes to control government and politics and policy in the world and, and everything else. Um, and while certainly, you know, Freemasons may have an influence in the world, um, the truth of the matter is that Freemasons are not allowed to discuss politics in lodge, in open lodge. It's forbidden. So people assume that there's this cabal of Freemasons in lodge that are discussing politics and what's going to, how they're going to push political agendas. But they will, that's actually forbidden in the Masonic lodge. They'll be kicked out for even discussing politics in Lodge. So uh, because it's meant to be a safe place where people of all different political backgrounds can come together. So the only way you can keep it a safe place is by not discussing politics. Uh, in Lodge. That's, that, that's, that's kind of that's kind of just the, uh, the truth for pretty much any situation. At the moment you discuss politics or religion, it's gonna get a little heated. That's exactly right. And in, in uh, you know, there's there's a certain degree. I have belonged to lodges that dis will discuss politics or will discuss religion, but they don't proselytize it. Mm. You know, it's not designed to proselytize. It's just like, well, here's an issue that's facing our world today. What can we do to help make it better? Um, whether it's, uh, it may not be in, you know, it may just be setting up a charity or 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 taking care of, um, I mean, like, for example, I live in Denver, Colorado, and uh, my Scottish Rite body, which is uh, some of the higher degrees of Freemasonry, uh, is on the board of Children's Hospital here. And we're on the board of Children's Hospital here because we are one of the largest financial contributors to the hospital. <laughs> and, and we do that because it's it's a service to help children. You know, we're, we're, we see it as a as a means to help the community and to help help children. But it's yeah. Whereas someone uh, online will be like, "See, they've even got their fingers in these hospitals. They're trying to control everything." Right. You know, it's just like that's right. Yeah, I mean, they're they're <laughs> clearly trying to extract adrenochrome from children. Or something <laughs> exactly, it's just not the case. And we don't. Yeah. We're not involved in in. Uh, we're not involved in uh, the, the medical you know aspect of, of it we're just no. getting funding to the hospitals you know yeah i mean to be honest i don't think it's that mysterious these days it's i mean like you said perhaps there is a little bit of influence because a, a lot of these people who are in high positions of leadership do belong to certain societies but in all honesty it, it's 
corporate interests and you know financial and, and kind of like global financial interests that run a lot of the uh, strategic decisions that are made in in the western world and and i think that with moving far more into a into a corporate run world than a, a governmentally run world and uh, you know the interests there are pretty transparent profit yeah we, we live in like a corporate feudalism now basically right. where you know people rather than belonging to a kingdom where the the feudal lord the king is providing for the people uh governments have set it up so that you people work for a corporation who then provides the health insurance mm -hmm. and the benefits and and protecting you know th their people and uh, yeah. I think there's far more abuses that happen on the corporate level right, right. in this world than any secret society does. But, you, you know, are we, are we maybe even heading into a time, I mean, you look at the way that the world is starting to pan out in terms of uh, censorship online and the restricting of information, because that is absolutely happening in our day and age more so in the last few years than ever. Are we maybe going yeah. into a modern situation which basically created the Freemasons and these societies to, to avoid persecution, to avoid uh, censorship and uh, to avoid the mob, which is certainly active these days online, shutting down uh, dissenting opinions. Are we maybe going to see the emergence of even more groups that are trying to, you know, talk underground about these types of things that we're trying probably. to discuss? Yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, anytime you, you suppress a group of people for, their thoughts i mean they're going to find other ways to organize yeah underground yeah and it's just it's been the history of the world yeah it, it, exactly i mean this is actually a real-time example of how these kind of societies got formed because you do already have like people setting up different apps to, to communicate or different platforms where people are being shut down on maybe twitter or facebook or youtube then suddenly people create other ones and it's kind of you know sent around the internet and so this is this is exactly how these types of societies started in the first place people can actually see a real-time example of why these kind of things are actually quite important because it is about mainly uh, unless there's infiltration and interference it's mainly about the preservation of knowledge and the preservation of it being able to discuss these things freely that's exactly right yeah and, and i would say too that any freedoms that the world has right now uh, through whether you're talking, uh, you know, granted by things like the Magna Carta or the Constitution of the United States or the Bill, Bill of Rights or, or any of these documents that uh, have granted freedoms to people, these social societal contracts that have been formed uh, and that were developed by enlightenment philosophers, people like John Locke and other, others. These people were all initiates within these secret societies. And that's part of what they were trying to do was to get people freedoms. They weren't trying to suppress people. They were right. literally trying right. to create a world order where people had freedoms because they knew that's the only way that society develops. That's the only way culture develops. That's the only way sciences develop. It's the only way that we can uh, save ourselves as, as humanity and to preserve things uh, from the past going into the future is if we have the freedom to, to have free discussion and you know, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, uh, you know all of these all of these things that we hold of value uh, in the world they, they come it, it could be argued that they are divine gifts from a higher consciousness and we have to protect them and we have to preserve them if we're going to keep them and that's the other that's the other part that these societies have always been involved in is, is trying to ensure that uh, these things are preserved because there have always been, whether you're talking about, you know, religious establishments or political establishments or corporations, um, there have always been people who have tried to monopolize truth and have tried to suppress others 
uh, who thought different ways or who, you know, viewed things a different way, so to speak. I mean, the, a good example is during World War II, you know, the, the first people that the Nazis threw in concentration camps wasn't Jews. The first people who went to concentration camps were Freemasons and Rosicrucians and Martinists and all these members of secret societies. That's who, that's who Hitler went after first because he knew that they were the, the people that stood for freedom. And he knew those were the people that would, were the only people that were organized underground enough to potentially stop him. And so therefore, it's also not surprising that you have people like uh, Winston Churchill and, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt and, and uh, you know, these other world leaders that were all Freemasons trying to stop Hitler. <laughs> now, you can argue how good of a, how good a people these people really were. I mean, I'm not going to say they're saints. I'm not going to say Winston Churchill was a, was a saint of a guy. <laughs> you know, or, or that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was, but they were definitely trying to work to preserve yeah. uh, certain freedoms that the Nazis were trying to take away at the time. Speaking of, uh, speaking of world leaders, you yourself have taken part in diplomatic meetings with governmental and, uh, and spiritual leadership. Who, who have you brushed shoulders with in these kind of settings and what kind of role did you play in these, uh, in these types of meetings? Well, you know, my I've I've been involved in a number of uh, I've I've done what's known as Track Two diplomacy, which which basically is going in to meet with certain world leaders before the cameras are rolling, right? So to speak, and to to get things hashed out and negotiated, and to ensure certain diplomacy is done prior to it being. Uh, on film for the world to see. So a bit of know. a pep talk, basically. Kind of, yeah. It's just getting, <laughs> getting the cards in place so that it, when it's time to actually show it to the world that uh, everything's already in place. So it, it appears to go more flawlessly. So, you know, I've done work in um, Turkey and in Lebanon and in Israel and in Palestine and in Colombia uh, and in uh, you know a number a number of different places around the world, but it's it's all it's always been in an attempt to get people to uh, find commonality and to use that as a starting point for peace talks and to promote uh, you know, greater peace in the world. I mean, a good example is, you know, that, that is another value within the, one of the things that, that you learn within the mystery school tradition is you, you begin to understand the language of symbolism and uh, what is a symbol and, and how something can become symbolic and how a symbol in one culture may mean the same thing or something different to another culture. And by understanding those relationships, you can get together two different people from two different cultures that may be at odds with each other. And you could point to their, you know, the symbols that they hold dear to them in those cultures. And you can show them how both cultures share the same idea or the same concept or the same, uh, they're striving for the same thing for their people and then get them to a point where they recognize that with each other so that they can come together for the sake of peace so that we're not blowing each other up, you know? So I do a lot of, a lot of that. I, I do speaking at, at, uh, U.S. embassies and universities around the world, and um, a lot of it is again just uh, helping people to see that uh, the people who they think is their enemy 
may not necessarily be their enemy <laughs> and that they may actually be working towards the same greater good they just have to stop um demonizing the other side so to speak I mean, which is the basis of diplomacy but uh, i mean a good example is um, you know if you were to if you were to let, let's say like in Nigeria, I've spent some time in Nigeria too. You know, Nigeria is a country where uh, in one part of the country you have radicalized Christians that are blowing things up. And the other part of the country you have ra radicalized Muslims that are blowing things up. <laughs> and so, uh, and everyone's heard of like Boko Haram and, and how they, you know, are kidnapping young children and and, uh, you know, it's a real problem there. So to help both sides see that they ultimately they both want the same things, which is prosperity for their people. Um, and then to recognize that they're actually, whether they're Christians or they're Muslims, uh, e even the even the Quran itself says that Jews, Christians, and Muslims and Sabaeans are all people of the book. You know, they're all good in God's eyes. So sometimes they just need to be reminded of that. You know? So like <laughs> instead of instead of uh, Muslims blowing up Christians or blowing up uh, Jews, you know, reminding them, hey, this is what your holy book says. So if you really want to be a good Muslim, then you're going to work with these people, you know, instead of trying to blow them up. It, I mean, it sounds simple. It's it's never quite that simple, but that's kind of the, the foundation. The well, you know, people always, uh, and I mean, we, we've seen this literally throughout our entire religious uh, history. People will always take advantage and bend and manipulate the, uh, you know, the, the, the scriptures and the talking points to suit their narrative if they happen to be yep. in control. It always comes down to human error. I mean, most of the time the majority of religions have a fundamental layer of agreement on certain core concepts that we kind of embrace as just the spiritual understandings of, of humanity but then humans just kind of get in and complicate it and ego comes in and control comes yeah. in and eventually people uh, condition <laughs> conditioning and greed and power <laughs> you know these are just the basic human traits. i mean do you think that these are just basic human traits or are these things to iron out over our developmental process and eventually will be beyond petty greed and disagreements and territorialism do we uh, are you optimistic about humanity in the long run Oh. oh dear <laughs> uh, i mean my, my my concern is that our our technology has outpaced our spirituality absolutely and and our spirituality is largely controlled by it used to be like if if in the ancient world if you were a high priest within any one particular religion and you traveled to a different territory uh where you encountered a different religion, that other religion would welcome you in and would want to learn from you. And it was understood that, that everybody was, was perpetuating a different perspective of the same mystery. So they could get along. So this is why you see uh, an initiate like Alexander the Great, for example, he would sacrifice at all the altars of all the different gods, including the god of the Jews. Uh, and that's just something you don't see so much anymore. Now you have everyone competing against each other. You have so much brainwashing involved and, and it's really for money. It's an economic thing. I mean, you have these different groups that are, are competing for a bigger slice of the pie, a bigger slice of the revenue. And so they, they compete against other religious traditions for that. And it's just, it gets really nasty. And, and that's not what spirituality is supposed to be about. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, um, that's what humans tend to do. So, and, and they will replace, if it's not religion, they will, they'll create a golden calf out of something else, whether mm. it be their business or their, 
their addictions or their whatever, and they'll fight to the death for it. And one of the one of the biggest challenges with people is they attach their egos to things outside of themselves. And then if those things become threatened, they go into fight or flight mode. Right. Right. You see this all the time with political parties. You know, people will align with a particular political party. And then if they feel like that political party is being threatened in any ways, these horrible qualities will come out of them where they will, um, you know, they'll go into fight or flight mode, mm -hmm. like they're personally being attacked, even though they're not. And uh, that's, that's the real danger of conditioning. Yeah any kind because people will will do that so i guess i i wonder if these are just infantile traits that we have to move through because from from like an evolutionary perspective it would feel at least that our destiny is to journey out into the cosmos i mean we're the only thing on this planet that is uh, in this multifaceted, highly dynamic version of evolution where we're developing the ability to speak across the world instantaneously with each other and we're developing yep. propulsion systems and we're, we have this incredible imagination and curiosity and, and, and wonder, which has obviously you know, driven people like us into these uh, mystery schools and into understanding reality. So there is this fundamental aspect of of being human where there is a, an incentive to know more and to learn more and so i wonder if you know maybe on a long-term scale it's a bit like you just kind of growing up going through puberty making mistakes as a young person and getting older and wiser and obviously on a on a human collective scale the timeline is going to be a lot longer than it would be for just an individual life journey to learn so perhaps this really is just a uh, a process of ironing out those infantile traits of jealousy and territorialism and greed and not being able to share properly a little bit like a kid on a schoolyard and uh, yeah. and and maybe we will get there but i mean i think we would also both agree that there has likely been many cycles of this type of behavior on this planet ones that we probably don't even have in our historical record and uh, and maybe we have got to this point before are we breaking out of it this time or are we just going around again i don't know i you know i sometimes i i personally believe and there are certain mystery school traditions that that teach this and this isn't going to be a very popular idea or it may even be unsettling to some but there is some archaeological evidence and there's certain traditions that have stated that actually earth at one point in time was just as advanced as it is now it's just it was just as populated as it is now uh, had the same technologies that we have now uh, as long ago as as 12,000 years ago and that uh, a great cataclysm came uh, probably during the Younger Dryas period and uh, during the last ice age and, uh, and just completely wiped out 95% uh, of the population of the planet. And all of our technologies were wiped out. We, we, were, we were literally uh, went back to the Stone Age and it's taken us uh, this long just to get back to the point where we were before. And if that is true, if that, I mean, it's a story kind of, even though there is there is things to back it up. But if that's true, then we're at a crossroads right now where we either need to get it together and finally uh, come together as a people and, and move to a new level that we haven't been at before as humanity, or we run the risk of the exact same thing happening to us again that tradition has said uh, happened, uh, you know, 12,000 years ago or 11,000 years ago. I mean, that, that, uh, and when you think about it, I mean, think about how much knowledge is stored on our technology right 
Mm. I mean, we're talking via cell phones. Yeah. We uh, most information is stored on the internet now. A lot of people don't even have books in their homes anymore because they just have digital books or they just have it saved on their computers or on their cell phones and, or their tablets. And these are all great tools that we've, but the more and more dependent we are on them, the more in trouble we're going to be if they go away. And, and the reality is, I mean, I used to work for the space labs up in Boulder, Colorado. And one of the things, the projects we were working on at the time, which is, which was, um, you know, top secret at the time and is now, you know, it's now public. You can, you can look it up. We were working with the space command at the time, which was the precursor to the space force. Mm -hmm. uh, but we worked on a, um, we were working on a satellite that was known as the, um, the ACE satellite, which was the Advanced Composition Explorer satellite. You can look up this satellite now. What it is, is it, it sits at a position known as the L1 point in space where the gravitation, the gravity of the sun and the gravity of the earth is the same. So it just stays positioned in this point, constantly monitoring the sun hmm. uh, in 24 seven, measuring solar pad, uh, particles coming out of the sun, killer electrons, solar flares. And part of the reason why we are doing that is so that we could have an early alarm system in case there's a massive solar flare that's gonna hit the earth. Uh, because if there is a major solar flare that hits the earth, which has happened in the past, and will happen again in the future. We can say goodbye we, to all of these nice lights and- uh... Yeah, that's right, yeah. If we have another Carrington event that right. happened in the 1800s, all of our automobiles, all of our pumps that are designed to pump water, all of our computers, everything electrical will fry and it will not work anymore. And all of our information that's stored digitally will be gone and we will have to start over and there's a real possibility that society could go completely into chaos at that point and destroy itself so who's gonna who's going to rebuild who's going to preserve the knowledge who's going to uh, have the underground network to try to bring social order back together again it's the secret societies that have been preserving this stuff through through memorization and through tradition all along. Uh, because it's not gonna be preserved on your tablet. It's not gonna be preserved on your phone. It's Those are gonna be gone. Yeah. And your car is not gonna work. <laughs> and so you, the water that you're used to getting out of your, your faucet isn't gonna work because the pumps aren't gonna be working to pump it there. Uh, so we're going to be in real problem when that happens in society. People don't realize how fragile civilization is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I hope it doesn't happen. You know, God forbid it does. But the reality is that it probably will at some point. And we are susceptible to these. Um, you know, we're susceptible to these things. Not, and this is goes even beyond the things we do to ourselves, like war and and uh, right. I mean, know, pick and pick and choose your apocalypse, basically. Right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but the more dependent we are on our digital, uh, our digital world, the more in trouble we're going to be when it's gone. Right. I mean, unless unless I guess the, the transhumanists get their way and we all download ourselves into some sort of neuralinked AI nightmare and fly off into space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. But they, even then you're running into the same potential problems. You know, all it takes is a solar burst or right, a star, right. you know, supernova or something, you know, completely wipe it out. Yeah. <laughs> Just erase yeah. it. <laughs> Before so, we kind of go into the uh, second hour, do you need to take a break at all for any reason? 
Uh, I want to grab, uh, if we're going to talk about the uh, in Egypt, our, uh, that, that passage I read. I yes, sir. That. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Okay. It's in, it's in one of these two journals. I just want to make sure I have it. Yeah, no problem, dude. No problem. I wish we could have uh, captured it on camera, but it all happened so quickly. It was really quick. But cool. Yeah, oh my god, right? I mean, at least there was a few of us who witnessed it for sure, 100%. You know, and I mean, I've seen these things before, you know, that that kind of stuff is uh, what I was first seeing in the night sky when I started going out and trying to attempt contact, you know, these, uh, these types of phenomenon are pretty common, actually, in the uh, in the old contact community. For sure. Yeah. I used to do some work with C-SETI. Oh, did you? I didn't know that. Yeah, a long time ago, you know, but, you know, like 20, 25 years ago, but yeah, we used to go out all the time and bring down UFOs. And People don't realize just how easy it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd exchange light signals with them. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, Are you going to be going to Las Vegas for this uh, Templar Collegia gathering? I will be there. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you would be. Yeah. Nice, man. It'll be good. Yeah. Last time we did it, we actually held it at, uh, last time we had something in Las Vegas, we actually held it at Kevin and uh, Kane Churko's. Oh, I was going to say, maybe you'll bump into them. You actually held, did you seriously? And you didn't know them at that point. Oh, no, I knew them. That's, oh, you we, knew we, them. That's, that's where we, yeah, they, they, they were both Templars. So I, right. You know, they, I knew them. So they I, were, okay, I thought you'd never met them before. No, they. so they. what they did is they allowed us to use their studio. And we, nice. So we had this, uh, this studio that I think, I, yeah, it was this big studio. We ended up turning it into like kind of a ritual space, then, <laughs> uh, which worked out really well. And then... Uh, I think the next day Carlos Santana was was going to be recording there. Oh, that's, like that. that's, that's pretty badass, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I often wondered like what you know what the vibe was like for. Yeah, you know, right. Like, <laughs> post post Masonic did. ritual kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah that's no. brilliant, man. The vibes must have been yeah. high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've put you on the spot trying to track this thing down, haven't I? Yeah, I'll see. It. I'm, I'm gonna have to get. I'm probably gonna have to go off a memory. Yeah, no worries. Are you alright? So maybe just uh, mute that notification that you're getting because I can hear it on my side. There, I turned it off. Awesome. Um, yeah. So ba basically, uh, yeah. Tim, Tim was trying to find the uh, the passage that he read out when we were in Egypt because we had. Uh, a bit of a strange experience. We actually had our own little airborne anomaly take place during our trip across Egypt. It was witnessed by, uh, well, the majority of our group, to be honest, as we were leaving the Saqqara Desert. Uh, do you want to tell people about the events that unfolded? Because it was quite a series of synchronicities that then culminated in this uh, this weird sighting of lights in the sky. Yeah, sure. So we, you know, we were uh, we were at Saqqara. We we were um we we're just leaving there actually and we had, we had a number of uh experiences there um uh, uh jp Haig was was there he had had kind of some intuitive experiences about uh you know a young pharaoh and uh and uh, we were talking about that and we were talking about the significance of the um the area and uh and then one of the things that i brought up was uh there's this manuscript it's known as the Thule manuscript and this manuscript was originally said to have been um uh it, it was a a papyrus from the royal annals of tutmosis the third and just to give some context, Tutmosis III was Pharaoh in about 1350 BCE. And um, he set up some of the first schools in Egypt. Uh, so he had, he had gone and invaded and, and united all of Egypt. He, had, he united all these different tribes that had been existing uh, throughout the area. He brought them all together. Um, he set up a new 
dynasty in which uh, and then he set up these education systems. But one of the things that this Thule manuscript says that supposedly the Vatican had had gone to purchase this this particular manuscript and and they had copied it all down and it was lost for a while and then it, it came to light again. But one of the things that it says is it has this very striking passage where it says something along the lines of in the year two, sixth hour of, or six or third month of the winter, sixth hour of the day or something like that, uh, uh, the scribes of the house of life found that a great fire circle disc had showed up in the sky. The king and his majesty looked on in amazement at this fire circle disc. Now, after a few days had passed over, lo, several more of these fire circle discs showed up in the sky. Uh, the people became confused by these fire circle discs and they, they laid down on their bellies. Um, and then it says uh, that it was like shortly fish thereafter, and yeah, fish a bunch of down, fish like, yeah. were, were <laughs> shot from the sky. Yeah, you know, from these fire circle discs, these this fish had been thrown out onto the desert, uh, which was something that Egypt had never seen before. Uh, and uh, they recorded it, and it was ordered that the the scribes in the House of Life record this event, you know, forever. Shortly after that happened, um, Tutmosis the Third. Oh, actually, here it is. I found it. Oh, great. It says, uh, in the year two, third, third month of the winter, sixth hour of the day. So it's pretty close. Yeah, got it right. Nice. Well done. Yeah. The scribes of the House of Life found that a circle of fire was coming in the sky. They thought it had no head and it emitted a foul odor. Its body was one rod long and one rod large. Now, after some days had passed over low, these things were more numerous than anything. They were shining in the sky more than the sun to the limits of the supports of heaven. Powerful was the position of the fire circle disc. The army of the king looked on and his majesty was in the midst of it. So that was kind of the foundation, right? And then later on, it talked about how uh, these fire circle discs shot a bunch of fish out into yeah. the desert. You know? Yeah, it was like and, fish, uh, fish, and other volatiles or something. Was the yeah, yeah exactly, the, yeah. yeah. And, and and they, you know, people were they didn't they didn't know they were confused by it. They fell on their bellies, and uh, it was ordered that the pharaoh ordered that they be um, recorded in the annals of the history of Egypt forevermore. It's really interesting too. Is shortly thereafter. And this isn't in the Thule manuscript, but these are in other manuscripts of Tutmosis the Third. It said, Tutmosis the Third said, they opened for me the doors of heaven. They spread open for me the portals of its horizon. I flew up to the sky as a divine falcon that I might see the mysterious ways in heaven. I was made full with the understanding of the gods. Wow. So so this is what Tutmosis the third says. He says that, you know, first of all, these fire circle discs showed up. They um, first it was one, then several, then they fired down, you know, all these fish and other things, freaked everybody out. They were on their bellies, they they recorded the information. And then Tutmosis the third says later he was taken up into the sky in one of these fire circle discs and he was taught the mysterious ways of the gods and it was shortly thereafter then that he set up the first schools in um, now i had just gotten done reading this while we were at Saqqara, and as we were looking at the pyramid lo and behold uh i saw a ufo show up and it started flashing and then i and then I pointed it out to everyone. I said, hey, I think I just saw a UFO. 
Uh, and sure enough, everyone started looking over at the pyramid, and then we started seeing the UFO again. Yeah, flashing. yeah, we we all saw this together. I think the uh, the crazy thing about it was just this weird step by step synchronicity. Because, like you said, we had JP Haig, who was actually the guy that invited me to to come out to Egypt, and he's a you know very sensitive, uh, intuitive type of guy, and he sat there for a moment when we were out in the Saqqara desert at that temple and uh, had a moment to himself and came back to the group and just said I had this really strong uh, you know kind of uh, vi vision and sense of a Egyptian prince a young child and there was a, a large disc above their heads and there was some sort of almost like a transference of energy between them and then our guide was like well there is actually these statues here and here is the royal children you can just see like the broken statues and so you had these two weird interesting little points then of course you read this passage on the on the way out of the desert as we were coming across just past the pyramid on the bus and then bam we see these uh, these flashes of light and i think a lot of people in the contact community will know what these are these are called flash bulbs this is what's been termed as flash bulbs it was a crystal clear blue sky you couldn't see uh, necessarily a discernible object but what you did see was this bright white flash of light and then in another part of the sky there was another bright white flash of light and i think we saw at least four or five of these very very significantly bright flashes and you couldn't see any sort of object and you definitely couldn't see any sort of airplane or drone or balloons or anything like that this was certainly uh you know some sort of anomalous activity going on in the sky but what a what a series of weird synchronicities and to just be coming out and seeing this pyramid and seeing these bright white flashes. And I mean, it happened so quickly. None of us had a chance to get a smartphone out and slap it against the window. I mean, my goodness, I was filming pretty much 99% of that trip and I still didn't yeah. manage to get it on camera. So, I mean, you know, this is the thing. It's a very elusive phenomenon and it's not easy to catch, but there was a, a few witnesses and uh, yeah, that was a, a pretty cool little highlight. And interestingly enough, Johnny Enoch had a friend of his who was part of the First Nations, I believe. Uh, he, I can't remember his his background, but he was someone who approached Johnny and said, "You're going to see a UFO in Egypt. Your group, yeah, you're all going to see right. a UFO in Egypt." And uh, yeah, that was a, a a pretty awesome little cherry on top of the uh, the cake. Yeah, well, and the fact that they appeared right after we read that passage, right after. Too. <laughs> them showing up for, i mean like within a minute within a minute you know? less than a minute i think it was literally yeah. within about 10 seconds of you finishing that passage that you just went oh my god i think i just saw a ufo <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah yeah i mean it's cool you know it's it's uh it certainly makes you wonder you know what yeah i mean traditionally again going back to the mystery schools they've always said that we live in this consciousness field you know, we are we are all part of this uh, this great mind. If you yeah. Will. Uh, the you know the Hermetic texts like the the Emerald Tablet, for yeah. example, talks about how all things were created through the meditation of the One. Yeah. Through His mind, and so the I, the implication is that we're living in this matrix, this mind matrix. Uh, which is what uh, you know. Modern physicists have also kind of come to the conclusion yeah. of. But uh, since we're all a part of this mind, it, it stands to reason that uh, it's not just people; it's animals, it's probably extraterrestrial intelligences, it's, it's everything else, and we're all we're all connected in it. Yeah. So uh, they, they, I, I believe that who, whoever they are are in these um, in these ufos uh are are they've clearly developed some sort of yeah. consciousness technology interface yeah and yeah. Uh, we, we see this also from people who go out and do field work of trying to bring down ufos i mean it's all about how do you unite your consciousness with the crafts to, to bring them within your facility. And um, I think on some level, that's what we were doing. We were a unified mind where we were, we were serious about our, our interests in not only ancient history of, of, of Egypt and, 
and how these fire circle discs showed up in the sky in ancient times. But here we were in the same location and uh, and they showed up. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Well, this is this is the thing. I, I mean, I talk about this all the time, that our esoteric and spiritual intuitive knowledge that has been echoed for you know thousands of years modern day science modern day physics is starting to catch up obviously they have approached it through a different observational lens the observation of material reductionism and observing piece by piece by piece whereas you know for for a long time and to be honest even still intuitive knowledge is disregarded and and kind of not considered to be part of the scientific method which is ironic because so many of the greatest scientists were also highly intuitive people like einstein and tesla and rene descartes and all these all these even others newton. even even yeah. newton yeah isaac newton's got some fantastic esoterically aligned quotes so you know you've got so many examples of intuition informing our scientific infrastructure but then the scientific infrastructure itself disregards intuition but we're getting closer to that time now i think especially with the uh, the advent of quantum mechanics and the way in which we're looking at the world from a scientific perspective and again people who listen to my interviews will probably hear me say this because i say it all the time but you listen to a quantum physicist give a lecture and it sounds almost akin to a spiritual discussion because they're saying the electrons in my body are the same as the electrons in yours and the space between us is shared by this energetic matrix and they're basically just saying the same things as spiritual people have been saying but they're using more complex language sets to explain it in. it's just more scientific verbiage but you're just saying we're all one we're all fundamentally energetically connected and uh, and I think that this is the way it works I do truly believe that the universe itself is this energetic lattice just a matrix of connecting networks and we are almost a bit like a biological quantum computer we're a, we're a node on this network and we can send and we can receive information consciousness is not restricted to just inside this kind of little neural sphere that we've got going on it can reach out non-locally through these energetic mediums and I think we're getting closer through science now to a point where spiritual teachings and scientific revelations are getting to this type of place. And I guess um, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, about where we're heading as humanity and technology being too high and spirit being too low. I guess for me, when I look at the way that we're developing, because we are obviously developing through this technological scientific medium, maybe there is a way in which spirituality can be recovered and our knowledge about reality can be expanded through technology as we kind of pierce deeper into reality and maybe through that we can start to subvert this desperate imbalance and bring it into equilibrium so I kind of I, I don't necessarily place all my faith in technological development leading us towards it but I also don't think I'm looking at it too cynically and I feel like there's a chance that that kind of stuff could bring us closer to being more unified yeah well in and let's face it, our technology in general tends to be based on concepts that uh, spiritual traditions have stated right. that we have for years. I mean, like, it, it's if you if you go and you talk with uh, like a Hopi Indian tribe in uh, the American Southwest, and you go and you talk with uh, Tibetan Buddhists on the you know, in Lhasa, for example, uh, they will both tell you that they're the same tradition and that they've psychically been communicating with each other for centuries. Um, to us, that sounds strange, but but isn't what we're doing right now, how is it any different? We're just using exactly. A, I mean, we're using, I'm using a cell phone right now to talk with you, right? But you're, you're in London and I'm in Colorado in the United States and we're able to instantly communicate with each other. We're able right. to see each other and communicate. I mean, that's a, that's a miracle. Yeah. Uh, but we're doing it through technology and, and all these spiritual groups have said is they do the same thing. It's just through other consciousness means yeah yeah it's it's all it's all types of technology i mean you know humanity has been developing technology since we first hit flint against flint and made fire or you know sharpen the first stick to make a spear all of these 
extensions of our own influence are essentially technology. So the, I, I would say, I would argue that technology is almost a natural part of the human developmental path. We seem to be these creatures that can excrete ideas from a non-physical space and manifest them into reality, which is just completely profound and is one of the things that fascinates me more than anything else. What is the nature of the imagination of the human mind and where are all of these ideas stored? How does it all channel out and why are we these only creatures on this planet? it that are physicalizing our ideas i mean it's an incredible thing to to be doing yeah it's like uh i mean even the internet itself is kind of just like a it's, it's like a storage for a collective consciousness right you know? right i mean that, that already exists independent of the internet but it's just a way of capturing it you know for it for a time so what draws yeah, you to ancient Egyptian culture and how solid of an interpretation do you feel we have of this civilization because what we're taught about in school regarding the dynastic Egyptians what we're told about the the methods through which the pyramids were constructed or the reasons behind their construction do you feel and I kind of already know the answer to this but I'm just playing devil's advocate do you feel the traditional interpretations and theories of academic Egyptology match up with the teachings of the mystery schools and the the depth of knowledge and sophistication that may have been present in ancient Egypt? Uh, I, uh, no, I, <laughs> I mean, I, so <laughs> I'm so surprised. Has, has always venerated Egypt. They've always said that, um, they've said that in general, the mystery tradition, and in particular, I'll, I'll speak from a Templar standpoint is, you know, the Templar order was formed because it believed, it, it truly believed that there was a great civilization in antiquity. You know, it's easy to call it Atlantis. That's the easiest way to call it. I mean, that's what Plato referred to it as. But you find, you know, you find it being called different names, in different parts of the world. But but there certainly was a global network in antiquity and it, and it fell apart, it crashed. And there were pockets where it survived in different areas. And Egypt was certainly one of these areas, according to the mystery tradition, where it survived and where knowledge was preserved. And so the Templar order was really formed to go out and find these different pockets and to bring that knowledge back together and to bring it into Europe to get Europe out of the dark ages, which is exactly what happened. I mean, that's what led to the Renaissance. I mean, the Renaissance happened because the Templars were bringing this knowledge back that they were collecting from these different groups that were preserving it around the world. And, uh, but I do believe that much about ancient Egypt, uh, and anytime you talk about ancient Egypt, you got to remember, we're talking about a time span of, yeah. of realistically 10,000 years of, of activity. You know, with different phases and different rulers and different uh, things going on at different parts of it, but but in in I believe there was a lot more going on in in um, ancient ancient times like uh, like Ice Age uh, times than is generally acknowledged, and I think that the um, I think a lot of the monuments are a lot older than standard archaeologists like to give them credit for. And I think there's evidence of a lot of uh, technology that was used in ancient times that uh, it was, we, can, we can clearly see it was employed in building these things and then it got kind of got lost again at, at some point. And it took a while to, to get it back. I mean, even, even the early dis descriptions of things they pulled out of the Great Pyramid uh, when they first broke into it, um, and they're finally able to break into it again, that, you know, there were all these stories of things that they pulled out of it, including uh, bendable glass, for example. Well, what does bendable glass sound like? It sounds like plastic, right? It probably was plastic. It was probably plastic things that they had in there, you know, that we've, you know, that have since, you know, disappeared or, 
or um, you know haven't survived any longer. Uh, but um, I believe, you know, this is just my my personal belief, but uh, you know, backed up by some mystery school tradition, uh, things like the Great Pyramid are are much older than archaeologists state. Uh, and I think they are probably used for lots of different things at different points. They're probably at one point in time, I believe that it was, it really was more of like a, almost like a power generator, like a, like a Wardenclyffe tower that Tesla created to broadcast right. yep. electricity throughout the area. I'm sure that's what it was used for. I mean, uh, and then, you know, as that, got shut off or is is that wasn't working anymore they used it for other things they used it as an observatory they probably used it to to store food they probably used it as an initiations uh center um and uh and then eventually they just sealed it up and and the 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 memory of what it was used for kind of got lost to antiquity but um what I do know for sure is that it, it was, there's no evidence it was ever used as a tomb. Uh, right, right. You know, I mean, that's the, the standard Egyptology. I mean, the guy who was, who was, was credited with saying that Kefren built the pyramid, uh, you know, he was, he got caught multiple times forging all kinds of, of things throughout Egypt. Uh, and uh, even the, the one verifiable hieroglyph that's found in the upper relief chambers of the Great Pyramid was uh, uh, that says Kefren. It wa wasn't even spelled right, <laughs> and, and it seems to suggest that it was probably the same Egyptologist who who just you know put it there to to say that he discovered it because he got caught doing that before. Oh he God. did that several other times before he got caught doing that. But Egyptologists kind of, in general, they just look the other way and they, they develop a story that they are comfortable with sticking to and then they just, you know, they stay to it. But it's just amazing that they've actually, I mean, because there is, we went to the Valley of the Kings, you, you know, we I've seen the, the, the kind of tombs and the, the, the gold and the, the hieroglyphs and, and the way in which it's presented. And then you go into these pyramids and there's, just nothing in them other than shafts and little specific rooms and there's no symbols. I mean, how yep. did we even accept that as the interpretation when there's literally just like no evidence for it whatsoever? Well, it was real easy when you didn't have uh, most Europeans going to Egypt. And they right, just had to yeah. trust whoever, you know, whatever the, the standard narrative was. I mean, it's kind of like you know, it's like uh, these narratives get developed, which usually serve some sort of a political or socioeconomic reason for them being developed initially, and then they just stick. It's, it's like, uh, you know, it's like this narrative that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas, you know, which is clearly false i mean yeah there's, there's yeah. evidence of all kinds of cultures having visited the americas including the including the freemasons right yeah yeah i mean there's there's templar there's templar uh uh artifacts all over the americas of uh, them having you know traveled here you know hundreds of years before columbus i mean there's vikings there's i live in colorado there's 30 site there's 30 different sites I'm aware of in Colorado that have Celtic Ogham writing on them. You know, I mean, it means the Celts were here, you know, for for I mean almost a thousand years before Columbus. So it's it's um, you know, it's all translatable, it's all there, but it also gets covered up and hidden because it doesn't fit the standard narrative. And um, and this is where, again, this is where the mystery schools come in because they try to preserve some of this, even when the rest of the world's gone crazy and is pushing narratives that are just not true. You know, they try to preserve a, a different history.
something that um, both you and Johnny Enoch were talking about whilst we travelled through Egypt was the imagery that you both referred to as the white cakes, uh, which is yeah. also potentially this this monoatomic gold, and and these are hieroglyphs yeah, that so depict. Uh, yeah, that for people that, that don't know, these are hieroglyphs that depict a, a substance. There we go. Timothy's holding some of it up, and uh, it seems to be utilized in many different ceremonial practices. And this was something that our guides, uh, I believe, uh, Muhammad Ibrahim had previously dismissed when Johnny first proposed the idea to him a number of years yeah. ago. But he's since shifted his opinion on this. Could you just explain what exactly uh, you believe these white cakes were, why they are important, and uh, have they? been left out of the traditional explanations why are they left out of the traditional explanations yeah so so traditionally there was uh, uh within the egyptian hieroglyphs you, you do you find these white cakes um they tend to be um depicted as either cones like you'll see the 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 pharaoh you know like usually sideways you know holding one of these cones um or uh, sometimes they're shown on top of a box as these round cakes with almost like a like a cross, you know, symbol in them. And uh, and you'll also find the words sometimes for white gold associated with them. And what it is is uh, in the Egyptian tradition it was called mifkuts which, which has been yeah which has yeah. come to mean uh it's sometimes translated as turquoise because of the the region where they found this was uh, had a lot of turquoise in it but what it actually is is it's um it is gold that has been in other platinum metals that have been converted into a monoatomic state. So most atoms are, you know, most molecules, well, all molecules and are usually composed of different atoms that are binding together. And so normally when you think of gold, it's a bunch of gold atoms that have come together to form this compound. Well, what happens when an atom is in a monoatomic state as the outer valence ring comes completely captured by the nucleus and it doesn't bind with anything. The two, the two um, electrons in the outer valence ring enter into what's called a Cooper pair. So they start spinning in a high spin state. And when they do this, then it doesn't bind with anything. And so it just, it just uh, appears as this white powder because each grain of that powder is one atom of gold. So it's this very, very fine powder and it appears white because it's deflecting the light because it's in this high spin state. So it just appears as, as, as white. That's what this, this is here actually at the bottom of this jar is it's all, um, that is just mon, and you can, and you might even be able to see it. Uh, I don't know if I put it here. You might not be able to see it very good. You can kind of just see just, the frosting at the bottom of the glass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what that. So that frosting that's kind of moving around is what it is. Is that that's mana. What's well, the other name for it? Is is mana. So in the in the Hebrew tradition, it was referred to as mana. Uh, and the reason why it was called mana is because in Hebrew, uh, mana just means, what is it? <laughs> and it's called, what is it? Because when you test it, uh, it doesn't appear as anything. Normally when you're, normally when you're testing something, you, you put it through either uh, a spectroscopic analysis where you, where you do a burn on it. And so then you can see the color of the flame, which will, which will tell you what the chemical is that you're working with. Or you can do a chemical analysis to see what it binds with. And in doing these tests, you can figure out what something is. Well, the mana doesn't react to anything. It doesn't bind with anything. So it doesn't show up as anything on these tests, which is the whole reason why it was called mana, or what is it? We don't know what it is. 
Um, well, so what, why, know- why do you think that this is what was being represented on the, on the walls of, uh, of these temples? It's a good question. So there's this mana was used for, and by the way, we know that um, the person who really developed this monarch a lot, like set up these, these entire labs, if you will, to process this mana was the Pharaoh Tutmosis III, the same person that we, we just read that passage right, from. Right, right, okay. So, but he, what, um, this, this mana has some very interesting properties. One is that it, um, it's super conductive. And two, it, if you take a container filled with mana and you take the same container filled with nothing and you subject this, the mana to a, a, a weak electrostatic or a weak electromagnetic field, then the container filled with the mana will actually start to weigh less than the container filled with nothing. So it sends, seems to what? cause anti-gravitational properties, right? Why is this significant? Well, well, and then the other thing it does is it, it's in um, treating uh, certain forms of cancer with it, it eradicates the cancer. So when you think about it, in fact, uh, most people, when they do like chemotherapy, for example, what they're actually doing is they're, they're being, they're putting heavy metals in their body in an effort to try to kill the cancer. Well, this is technically a platinum metal, but it's in a monoatomic state. So it's not poisonous to the body like heavy metals are, right? but it does do the work of curing the cancer. So they were probably using it not only for health, but also they were using it to um, potentially make things lighter, like heavy stones to move them. And, uh, and in fact, in the other, the other property of them is because they're super conductive. I want you to imagine this. If you were to take so we've all heard of the Ark of the Covenant, right? I mean, you think of the Indiana Jones movies. What was the Ark? We know what the Ark was. The Ark was, uh, it was, it was built out of these different layers of gold and acacia wood, and it was basically a big capacitor where it would build up static electricity over a period of days which would start to be discharged through the wings on the top of the, of the box, right? And, you know, this seemed miraculous to, to the ancient people. Uh, but it's, it, the Bible describes that you, you couldn't touch the ark because if you did, it would elect, it basically would shock you to death, right? They, they just said you would die if you touched the ark. Right. I mean, even there's even a description in the Bible where someone was transporting an ark and it started to fall off the oxen cart. And so someone went to brace it to keep it from falling off and struck him dead immediately. (laughs) So I don't think God really wanted that person dead for just trying to stop the 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 ark. I think it was uh, I really believe it. He was chopped to death. And so if you. The Bible also tells us that mana was stored in the ark. So if you take this superconductive substance that the that the the Egyptians were developing, you put them inside of a giant capacitor, that's going to cause massive electrical output, right? Now imagine this: if you were to take that same box, and by the way, the Egyptian temples depict these boxes. All like all of the temples that we went to in Egypt. Oh yeah, they they're everywhere. Depictions of these boxes, right, issuing forth electricity. So, if you were to take one of these boxes, put the mana in it, and then put that inside the king's coffer in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid, with all the, uh, the conductive pyramid, rose quartz granite and all of the, that's you know, right. 
That's right. And the, the pyramid itself is already a giant electrostatic capacitor. I mean, if you were to stand on top of the Great Pyramid with a with a bottle, a glass bottle, and you put a wet rag on the top of it, sparks will start shooting out the top mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. Because it just builds up all that static electricity from the desert. So again, you, you have something like the Great Pyramid, and then you put this capacitor, the an arc in the center of it filled with this superconductive substance it's going to generate a massive amount of, of power that's just going to broadcast to the area much like what uh, nikola tesla was trying to do so i think this is one of the mysteries of ancient egypt it's certainly within the alchemical tradition of which was said to have come out of egypt uh they were Alchemists were certainly engaged in how do you extract this mana, yeah. uh, which they also referred to as the white stone and the stone that the builders rejected, and the, and the, you know lots of other names. And by the way, from a biblical standpoint, who was in charge of carrying the ark? Who was in charge of protecting the ark? It was the Levites, and this is where we get the word Levite levitation from levitation uh, because if you recall i mean the ark just based on the amount of materials that was made out of would have weighed several tons and yet two people could just carry it with rods and of course if if it was if you had mana in it and you had that electrical charge activating the mana it would have caused that weightlessness that <laughs> that levitation that anti-gravitational effect and therefore and and this takes it one step forward into the ufo research as well and uh, because what were ancient flying craft called and what was what were these flying craft called these ufos called in the ancient world well we know in sumer they were referred to as shimanas Shimanas, right? In ancient India, they were referred to as vimanas. Vimanas. What's the commonality here? Mana. 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 That's right. So mana yeah. is the secret. And even within the um within the uh some Jewish traditions, for example, there's an Ethiopian text known as the Kebred Ganas, which talks about king solomon's flying ship mm. that he had you know where he used to fly <laughs> from uh jerusalem to ethiopia to visit the queen of sheba and, and back again it says he would travel in a couple hours what would take most people several days to travel wow. uh in his flying ship well you know what was solomon doing he was he was producing mana and he was the one who had the ark Right. So that's in fact, he built the Solomon's temple just to store the ark and the ark was built to store the mana. <laughs> so this is the secret. This is really the secret to uh, some of these in- anti-gravity technologies. And we find it all over the ancient Egyptian temple walls. Yeah. And I so mean, I think uh, there's definitely a technology there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, after vi- uh, piling on to what you've just said about you know, the, the way in which they may have been utilizing this monoatomic gold and the properties of this monoatomic gold and, and the arc and the fact that you could almost see it as the uh, the, the generator core of the Great Pyramid. Um, you go into these places. I mean, when we were in the King's Chamber, you, you look at these absolutely gigantic, gigantic slabs of uh, rose quartz granite, all highly conductive materials, piezoelectric materials that can create and streamline conductivity. And, you know, you you start to click these things together. And after visiting many of these sites in Egypt, listening to our guides and to you and Johnny, it seems to me that the ancient Egyptians were in some way uh, masters or at the very least had a highly sophisticated knowledge and appreciation for the physics of resonance of sound, tonality, vibration. Uh, you know, yeah. these, these are, as you were saying about Nikola Tesla, these are the realizations that Tesla also stated would lead us to far greater understandings of our reality. I mean, to quote him verbatim, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So, I mean, 
do you do you think that the ancient Egyptians, or at least as you were saying, because it's a ten thousand year period, at least some aspects of the ancient Egyptians were far more sophisticated in their understanding of energy, frequency, and vibration than we give them credit for? I absolutely believe that, and I think they were. I also believe that they were, you know, they were using some of these electrical currents. I mean, one of the things that I talked with. Uh, Muhammad Ibrahim about while we were on our trip was you go to a number of these temples and they have these uh, stones with these kind of butterfly what are known as butterfly clamps between yeah. them and you know of course the, the standard conventional theory is that oh they were th these used to have nobody can test that these used to have metal in them uh, but, the, you know, the theory is, oh, they did these to hold the stones together. And, uh, you know, Muhammad pointed out correctly that uh, actually these would not work at holding the stones together. They would have the way they're they're structured, they would they would totally break very easily because the the um, the wide part is is on the, the stone and where they connect is very thin. And uh, they, they wouldn't have held up together very good. Uh, this, by the way, this is something we find on both sides of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. But there is a possibility that if, you know, these, these things are all lined up and uh, where they had these metal clamps, they're all lined up along the pavement around the temple. Um, and you, and you, we found this in several different places. A greater probability is that those are probably what was used to uh, pick up the electricity that was being broadcasted within the region. So you could just kind of tap into it. They were like the electrical outlets, you know, that you could just plug things into, if you will, uh, to, to power whatever, you know, you were doing. So I, I think that's probably what was going on. Um, there's certain, certainly allusions within the Egyptian hieroglyphs as well to, you know, different forms of flight. And uh, while they didn't call the monoatomics mana, certainly the, the Jewish tradition, which kind of came out of Egypt via, via the Phoenician and the Canaanite, uh, traditions that came out of Egypt and then formed, ultimately ended up forming Judaism as, as we know it today. Uh, and of course, those Jewish texts do talk about, you know, Moses, for example, being raised in uh, the Egyptian courts and, and that type of thing. Uh, it seems to suggest a tradition is being passed down and that the mana being discussed in the Bible uh, is the same substance, the same white cakes that were also known as the bread uh, in the um, in the Torah or the Old Testament. And by the way, this is also why we find passages like, for example, it talks about how King Solomon used to receive 666 talents of gold each year in exchange for bread hmm. well in the ancient number symbolism 666 was a number of transformation it had nothing to do with a beast or a, the devil or or any of these things that like people like to put on it today but so if if we know that number is alluding to transformation and the text says that that uh that King Solomon was receiving 666 talents of gold a year in exchange for bread. What it was saying is he was transforming or transmuting the gold into the bread. So he was turning the gold into these white cakes, uh, this white mana. And uh, th there's lots of examples of that. We're just not used to looking at it that way. We were uh, we were fortunate to have. Oh, by the way, are you are you happy to push just a little little bit longer? How are you doing? Sure. Yeah, yeah totally fine. Awesome, yep. man. Appreciate it. Um, 
yeah, we were we were fortunate to have the opportunity to to gain private access to the Giza Plateau and, and the Great Pyramid, which was uh, was a profound thing in of itself. And uh, on on top of this, we were able to perform an initiatory ceremony led by yourself, which was a very powerful and, and personal experience that I'll never forget. Um, but a number of years back, you were caused a little bit of a drama on the uh, on the whole uh, Egyptian front with the government. It became a, an internationally reported incident, even making its way into the publications like The Guardian over here in the UK. And this was, uh, this was back in 2011 when you were in Egypt with the famous Belgian author and lecturer Robert Baval. Can you, can you just tell people what went down at the Giza Plateau in 2011? Sure. So in 2011, there were, well, first of all, I was out there um, with a number of other researchers. Uh, we were looking at, uh, amongst other things, uh, the research of Gattenbrink, who was a German scientist who had been doing some studies in the Great Pyramid. He had, he had been looking at uh, the shafts. There's these shafts in the Great Pyramid that go from the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber towards the outside of the pyramid. And uh, he had sent a robot up one of them and he discovered a door. And this was public knowledge. Uh, he even drilled through the door and put a fiber optic camera through it. And he saw another door further up. And that was revealed to the world. Um, what was not revealed to the world at the time was that he then took the fiber optic camera, put it through that hole that he put in the door, and then he looked at the back side of the door. And on the back side of the door, there was writing. And this writing, what was so controversial about the writing is it's not Egyptian. And in fact, it wasn't any language that we were uh, entirely certain what it was. Uh, we know it wasn't Egyptian, that the best guess that we could come up with is it was similar to what's known as the Vinca script, which you find in uh, some areas of Eastern Europe. It's this ancient script that's about 12,000 years old. And uh, it is deemed to be one of the oldest scripts in the world, but it's also um, never been translated. So we, we saw this. We were looking at this, and uh, as researchers, we were trying to figure out what it was. Uh, the problems with it, of course, were that um, whoever put that there did so when the pyramid itself was built. And uh, uh, they had to have known that it wouldn't be discovered until, uh, A, someone had the technology to send a robot up that shaft with the fiber optic camera to see it, because that's the only way you can see it. So that's a problem. Uh, if you consider how old the pyramid is, even by standard Egyptology, that's a problem. And two, because it's not Egyptian, it implies that there were other people involved in building the pyramid and what the standard narrative is. And Gattenbrink was so freaked out by that whole thing that he just walked away from the project. So we, we were there, we were looking at uh, some of this research, we were trying to figure out what it was. And then while I was there, I also performed Templar initiations inside the Great Pyramid. And there's been a long history of our order performing initiations inside the Great Pyramid. Uh, uh, the Grand Master before me, Raymond Bernard, he had also performed initiations in the Great Pyramid a number of times. Um, you know, going back in history, even uh, Napoleon was initiated in the Great Pyramid at one point in time. Uh, and there are legends that talk about how even Jesus had been initiated in the Great Pyramid uh, at one point in time. In fact, there's a there's a text known as the Leviticon, uh, which talks about how Jesus you know, was studied and was initiated in Egypt before he did his uh, mission, so to speak. So, uh, but, the, you know, the legend is that he was initiated in the Great Pyramid. So our Templar order has continued that tradition. And in 2011, uh, we 
again, once again, uh, in, me as Grand Master at the time, I was able to initiate people in the Great Pyramid. Things were a little tense in Egypt in 2011 because the Arab Spring was going on at the time. And Mubarak's, President Mubarak's offices had just gotten bombed while we were there in Egypt. And uh, things were really tense. And in fact, the building that Mubarak used to be, his, where his office used to be, isn't even there. Anymore. It's right next door to the Cairo Museum. And they just tore it down. It doesn't even exist anymore. This last time when we were in Egypt, that whole building was just gone. But, uh, you know, things were a little tense. So while we were doing initiations in the Great Pyramid, um, I think what happened is after the fact, some of our, we had a number of world leaders that were uh, in town that were being initiated in the Great Pyramid at the time. I was the one initiating them. And uh, so I'm sure there was intrigue surrounding that. I guess you can't say, uh, I guess you can't say who the, the world leaders were. Well, I mean, there were certain leaders from Nigeria and Lebanon and, and other places. I mean, that were, were all converging in right. Egypt for me to initiate them. And, and um, you know, it was beautiful. It was, it was a really beautiful ceremony, but, um, you know, which we did the same way it's been done for forever. But, uh, but uh, when word got out that something was going, some forms of initiation were going on in the, the pyramid, uh, I think people just started freaking out. And then, and then the conspiracy mill started going and, and people started uh, oh, making up all kinds of crazy stuff. Like we were involved in some sort of Zionist conspiracy and we were going to erect a star of David on top of the Great <laughs> Pyramid and just other, all kinds of other craziness. But, uh, and, you know, and it was, they knew, they didn't know exactly what we were doing in there. They assumed it was some sort of Masonic-like uh, type of initiation and then to make things even more complicated uh, it was November 11th 2011 so there was this kind of numerical lineup of 11 11 11 <laughs> and, uh, and there were these other groups that had come to the Great Pyramid at that time to perform like Oh, peace ceremonies at the at the base of the Great Pyramid, like around on the outside of the pyramid, and um, and things just kind of like I think started getting out of control, and the government out of fear of the implications, and that Mubarak's offices had just gotten bombed, and everything else, they they just shut down the pyramid right after that. They I mean, they, they grac graciously, um, you know, we left the country. Uh, they, they made sure we safely got out of the country. But then they, like, kind of issued this press release, like they had kicked us out, even though they didn't <laughs> really kick us out. You know, they had to kind of save face at the time. And, um, yeah, and then it ended up making the, 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 uh, the news because... Uh, yeah, the pyramid was shut down as a result of it right after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've, you've certainly had a, a few interesting excursions out into places and, and caused a little bit of drama along the way. But you've been on uh, you've been on a few different trips with uh, with Robert Baval. You were out in Lebanon with him back in 2013. And am I right in saying that the research that you were involved in within the Bolbak region of Lebanon with Robert Baval later inspired uh, Graham Hancock to write about it in one of his books and, and go out to the region himself? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so Robert Buval and myself were were guest speakers at the American University in Beirut, and so we both gave uh, presentations there. And then while we were in Lebanon, we also went to Baalbek, mm. which uh, is near the Syrian border. the The region is controlled by Hezbollah, so it's kind of a you know, and Hezbollah is considered a terrorist organization by the 
least the United States and, and I believe Britain as well to consider Hezbollah a terrorist organization. Um, but that whole region, if you go into that region, you'll see all these compounds everywhere with these yellow flags on top of them. Well, those are all Hezbollah compounds. And, and so Hezbollah, unfortunately, kind of controls that, that whole region. And they receive money from Iran uh, to uh, largely to fight against Israel. Um, and they and they just kind of dominate that region. And unfortunately, Baalbek is right in that region. So when we went there, we had, uh, fortunately, we had uh, a certain Templar brothers and sisters who were also Druze, who lived in Lebanon, the Druze faith. They're a Unitarian Gnostic faith in the region. And they, they, uh, we've had like the Templar Order and the, Dru the Druze have had close relationships for centuries. And they refer to themselves as Tahid, the Tahid Mahudun, uh, the sure path. And they, but they, um, they have some, uh, you know, because they're not Christians and because they're not, Muslims, but they get along. They tend to get along with everybody. Uh, you know, for the most part, they're left alone. Even though, um, like Kamal Jumblat, who was the prime minister of Lebanon, the president of Lebanon, he he was assassinated back in the eighties, and he was a he was a Druze. Um, and his son, Walid Jublad, is currently the grandmaster of the Druze. But so they, they gave us safe passage into Lebanon or into Baalbek area. And, and while Robert and myself were there, we, we were examining certain stones, uh, certain. Baalbek is a series of Roman ruins, but they're all built on top of these ancient platforms of these huge megalithic stones that weigh you know anywhere between one and five thousand tons each and so to give you a perspective the stones in the great pyramid all weigh around three tons each wow so imagine a so imagine a one thousand to five thousand ton wow. uh block i mean granite stone i mean they're just gigantic they're as big as they're bigger, actually, than the unfinished obelisk that we saw in Aswan. In Aswan, yeah. They're, wow. Yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just huge. So one of the things that we were looking at while we were there was there's, a, there's an area that's been called the quarry of Baalbek, where there's a giant stone there. And forever, people thought that was the largest quarried stone ever in the world. But just recently, there was a team of scientists, of archaeologists, who started digging underneath that stone, and they found another stone that was oh, twice no as way. big no way. that it was resting on. So, wow. so we were there to see that and to look at some of these other stuff. And to, and to, um, Graham was already doing research related to Baalbek. He knew that there was these giant stones there. Uh, he just hadn't seen them, and so we were we were taking a look at that. Um, we were reporting some things back to Graham, and then later on, when Graham was writing his book *Magicians of the Gods*, he wanted to get into Baalbek so that he could uh, so that he could see for himself these stones, and and that he could take pictures and. Uh, and about a third of his book, Magicians of the Gods, is all just based on Baalbek. So, uh, so I got involved in um, employ, like asking certain Templars who were also Druze to to help escort him into the region. Uh, and so, if you, if you ever pick up the book, Magicians of the Gods by Graham Hancock, you'll you'll notice in the acknowledgement section. At the beginning of the book, he writes about 
he acknowledges a bunch of people with the last name of Jarmakani. Well, those are all Druze <laughs> that help help to get uh, him in there. That, that I helped to arrange to get him into Baalbek, and then um, and then later in the book, dirt on the chapter of Baalbek, he actually acknowledged me. Uh, you know, wrote about some of my research related to Baalbek. Well, you're friends with Graham, aren't you? You've known him for quite correct. some time. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, we've been. Yeah, friends for a long time. Uh, he's, he comes to Colorado a fair amount in the United States to to speak, and and also I I, I think it's no secret that you know he's written quite a bit on psychedelics. Oh yeah, and on uh, uh, the use of um, psychoactive substances, including things like marijuana and. Of course, Colorado has a very open policy of these things. Yeah, you Marijuana guys are kind of leading, here. <laughs> leading yeah, edge. So, I know, yeah, sitting so. sitting here in the in the dark ages in this country. My goodness, we're waiting to catch up. But uh, yeah, yeah, Colorado is certainly on the leading edge of bringing back the uh, the psychedelic renaissance. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we have uh, you know both marijuana and uh, psilocybin and mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, are, are, are legal here. You're not going to be arrested for them and. Uh, um yeah it's just a kind of a standard part of the denver scene i guess so. <laughs> yeah well I'm, i mean i would love to get out to uh to see Baalbek at some point i mean my goodness it's such a shame that so many of these uh regions are, are so destabilized and it's hard to get out to them because you just have such fascinating examples of anomalies in history like how how are these things being created but uh this has been such a great talk. Let's briefly just kind of wrap up with something a little lighter and a little bit more quirky. Let's talk about uh, Denver Airport real quick because this yeah, is something. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is something I came across a couple years back. Uh, so for those that don't know, Denver Airport is is littered with weird posters about the Illuminati and underground bases yeah. and paranormal cover-ups that may or may not be taking place in the in secret areas of the airport and there's even a website called the Den Files so they've really capitalized on this whole idea that something uh, weird is going on at Denver Airport but what surprised me is uh, when we were just kind of chatting in Egypt and you said that you'd actually had a hand in this decision to place uh, a lot of these messages inside the facility. So could you just yeah. just explain uh, why there is this weird conspiracy about Denver Airport and what your role was in all of this provocative messaging? Sure. Well, so, I mean, the airport, I mean, it's 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 been open now for, you know, over 25 years now at this point. But... Um, it, I mean, there, there are kind of things in state. When, first of all, when the airport was built, it was bit, built out in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Um, and Denver had an airport that was close to, to downtown. Yeah, it was known as Stapleton Airport. And they decided to build a new airport that was really far away, like, like 25 miles away from Denver itself, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so there was always speculation about why that came to be. I mean, some of that had to do with um, financial decisions. Denver basically annexed this whole, this large property from Aurora and uh, the city of Aurora, which is one of the suburbs of Denver. And I grew up, my father was in Aurora politics and my step mother was also in Aurora politics. So they were both on Aurora City Council. My father was mayor of Aurora. And uh, in fact, a lot of the, there's, there's roads. Um, well, there's a, there's a Space Force base that's near Denver International Airport. And it has a, has a road in front of it that's named after my father. There's a convention center at the Gaylord that's out at Denver International Airport property that's also named after my father. And so, you know, I grew up very much aware of the politics behind creating the airport and that whole airtropolis region that's out there. Um, there was plans and there's still plans for that airport to be a, uh, you know, again, it's an airtropolis Eventually, there's a there's a whole spaceport 
that's mm-hmm. out there that's, that's planned already for the you know for the future for future space travel and so that you know of course stirs up the imagination but then there's also all this art and where i got involved was there is a masonic time capsule <laughs> in the airport so when they built the airport they wanted to put this masonic time capsule there, right okay and which is not uncommon in colorado colorado has is a very masonic state uh all the, all of the the mountain peaks that are that are over fourteen thousand feet uh high that are named after people are all named after famous freemasons most of them were from Colorado, uh, include, including uh, like Pike's Peak down in Colorado Springs, who was named after Zebulon Pike, who was Albert Pike's nephew, and uh, you know Mount Evans, and you know all uh, Long's Peak. All all these things are named after these famous Freemasons that uh, belong to lodges here in Colorado. So there's already all of the government buildings in Colorado, in the Denver area, all have Masonic cornerstones on them already. It's just kind of a part of the history here. So when they built the airport, they wanted to have something like that, but could be publicly viewed. <laughs> uh, so they they created a, a, a time capsule with a sundial on top of it. Um, I didn't have any part in that planning but where i came in is they decided to put a braille plaque on that time capsule and the person they asked to do it was the secretary of my lodge a man by the name of warren glover so for the first probably 10 years we had just a plastic plaque on there and then um, warren and i went and uh, put the metal plaque on there which uh, is now the cause of so much controversy. (laughs) Uh, But tied into that then was a bunch of other art that was put in the airport that all had symbolic value. And, you know, I'm a, uh, traditionally my main area of focus and research is on symbolism. Right. I love symbolism. So, uh, when they wanted to put symbolic art into the airport, then it, it just stood to reason that the artwork was chosen that had uh, symbolic messages. And um, and one of the things that also got put in there then was these gargoyles that were put <laughs> in the baggage claim area. And, and, and the reason why we put the, baggage, the, the gargoyles in the baggage claim area originally was actually because the bag, we, we, we had a new baggage claim system that had never been used before. It was supposed to be state of the art, super fast, so people could get their luggage right away. Well, it wasn't working. <laughs> it kept falling apart, kept, wasn't working. They, they determined it had gremlins in it or something. So, so what we did is we put these, these uh, gargoyles in the baggage claim to scare away the evil spirits. <laughs> to get the magic flame working again and people loved it so we we kept it and that added to this whole like weird atmosphere of the airport um the other thing that happened was uh, we put this really ugly uh statue of a horse what like call it <laughs> yeah. lucifer with like the laser eyes uh, and stuff. With these, like these glowing eyes and <laughs> And, you know, the person who, the artist who made that horse was not a Freemason. His biological brother was a Freemason out in California. But the artist who made the horse was not a a Freemason. But in the process of making the sculpture, a piece of it actually fell down and severed an artery in his leg. And no way died. no shit so, so, really but, so it killed him so then oh my the god was, the city had this uncomfortable situation where they had agreed to pay all this money for this sculpture <laughs> that was that was 90 percent done but it killed the artist and so they, oh my god they decided, well, 
I mean, we already paid for it. You know, we'll just we'll just hire some other artists to finish it, and then we'll still put it up. So they did, but its history is a little tragic. Yeah, and of course, it, it, it comes across as like the guy was some sort of uh, sacrifice or something for the airport, but that wasn't that wasn't the intention. So it, anyhow, all of this has led to more and more conspiracy theories over the over the years. There's also um, if you look at the airport from the air, it looks like where the way the runways are laid out, it looks like uh, a giant swastika. Oh no! Which, I'm guessing which, that wasn't you know, intentional. <laughs> well, I mean, it it was not intentional so much. I mean, it was the best way to. I mean, Denver International Airport is the largest airport in the world in terms of um, land mass. It's the third busiest airport in the world. And it uh, they needed a number of air runways in order to be able to take all these planes off because it's a central hub for the United States. And so part of it was practical from a symbolic standpoint, that symbol was a sacred symbol to the natives that lived in the region. Oh, seriously? So, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a, the swastika is an old symbol. Oh, I know, you know yeah. Predating the, yeah, the Nazis. Yeah. I mean, it was, in fact, you find it all over Baalbek. Even, yeah. In Lebanon. And in uh, uh, India as well, I think. And in, in or, or in India, the Buddhist, Buddhist yeah, traditions. Tibet, and yeah. yeah, Tibetan tradition. You find it all over. Originally, it probably came from the alignment of the Big Dipper mm. to the North Star during the solstices and equinoxes. So yeah, if you align, yeah. if you align the Big Dipper to the North Star during the solstices and equinoxes throughout the year, it ends up forming a swastika in the sky. <laughs> so that's that's the origin. That's probably the origin of that symbol. Um, however, if you're you know if you're you start going down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole and you start looking at all this other stuff. <laughs> well, you certainly, certainly put enough fuel Sinister. on the fire, haven't you, for people to start yeah. thinking, oh, well, it's all connected. It's all connected. It's all part of the Freemason plot. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> it so, was just, uh, yeah. And I, and I think now they're doing the renovation of the airport. Actually, my, my brother-in-law is uh, one of the people in charge of renovating the airport at, at the time, at currently and uh his company and uh so you know the idea was to just kind of have fun with it yeah you know, everyone's <laughs> talking about these conspiracy theories anyways so you know let's just while the airport's under construction let's put up these <laughs> silly banners you know that kind of play up this myth you know and kind of have fun with it you know so people have yeah. something fun to look at and to think about as they're uh, you know, still traveling in the airport. So. <laughs> well, I love it. I mean, it was I was just maybe laugh when when you said that you've been involved in it because I I just remember coming across it a while ago and being like, that's a really weird airport. What's going on there? I wonder what's uh wonder what they're trying to hide. It's it's just funny thing to to find out that you had a hand in. But uh, dude, we I had such a such an amazing time with you out in Egypt. I mean, with the whole group as well. But just you know, you're such a encyclopedic just think tank full of all of this esoteric knowledge i just love hearing you talk about it not only that you're just a great guy you're a really nice guy we genuinely became friends on that trip and uh, it's a real privilege to call you a friend and to and to be connected to someone who's just got such a depth of knowledge and uh, i've really really enjoyed this chat i think people are going to be loving this conversation because we've just covered so much stuff i mean we've been going for two and a half hours now <laughs> well the respect is mutual i'll tell you and uh, I'm, I'm so happy to count you as a friend i had i had so much fun with you all of our adventures in egypt and i'm looking forward to uh, you know, so many more adventures into the future as well.